Welcome to our sixth lecture on the macroeconomic perspective. And I would like to just highlight some of the objectives. We want to understand and describe domestic product, gross domestic product, GDP, net exports, net national budget. Um, we're going to look at nominal versus real values. What does it mean to track GDP over time? Why should we care? And then how do we compare gross domestic product GDP between countries or among countries? And what might we otherwise use? What are some of the limiting factors to just looking at GDP? Um, so it's important to think about how is gross domestic product calculated? You know, what um, does it look like? And so from the U.S., you have consumption. That's the purchasing of individuals like you and me. There's investment, which is really the spending of business. There's government uh, expenditures, which is usually hovers around 20%. Usually consumption is about two-thirds, 67%. Investments at this particular point in time when this was calculated, 15%. And then we have exports, what we sell to others, minus imports. So it's kind of weird. This is actually subtracted out. So if you added all these together and wondered why it was over 100%, it's because you have to take out the imports, what we buy from other countries to get our GDP. If you click the link on uh, the PowerPoint, you'd come out and you'd just get some more current data because uh, you can get the most current data online. I think it's important that you can see what happens beyond the time frames in our lecture material, but this is looking at gross world products, so not just the domestic product production of a country, but the world as a whole. And you'll see that on average, there's been growth most years in a recession back in 09. It, there was a decline in 2020. There's expected to be a, a more significant decline in the world total productions of goods and services. So just encourage you to go ahead and use online to get more current so we've talked about gross domestic product, kind of how it's calculated, the pieces that go in and out. On the left, this is another way of looking at it, was that idea that the consumption piece, consumers you and I buying, is a big portion of it, roughly two-thirds. Governments, another piece. And businesses for buying from each other, making investments for the future, is another big piece. And then we can look at kind of the import exports where import line is higher, which it was back before my birth in 1970. Uh, for much of the time, we were selling more to the rest of the world than buying from them. Since then, we've mostly been um, buying more things from the rest of the world than we sell to them. And, uh, and that's our current reality. So there are different things that we're uh, buying. Services has been increasing. You see that this line is going up. It's the biggest portion. Uh, almost now it'd probably be 50% or higher if we went out to 2020 of our economy is services. Education is a service. Healthcare is a service. Getting your hair cut is a service. And then there's things durable and non-durable goods. So a durable good is consumed one-time use. It might have a lifespan under three years. So I think toilet paper quickly. Non-durable goods are those things that you buy that last longer than that, multiple use. I'm thinking like my lawn tractor, for example, and then in um, structures, buildings. So when we want to look at the process of adjusting nominal values to real values, first we need to have a set of values. The nominal values are what we would see, and here they are from 1960 through 2010, just as a, a, a sub-example of what GDP. So if we went back all the way to 1960, we were below one trillion. Here in 2010, we're up to nearly 15 trillion. Just in 2020, we've created, in addition to GDP, we produced another three trillion of, of money supply, but we'll be over 20 trillion as a GDP for the US in 2019. So the 
red line is measuring that nominal GDP that we had seen. The blue line is measuring real GDP. And it has to be relative to a specific dollar in a specific year. And in this graph, they just chose 2005, which means that's where the graphs, the two real and nominal, will cross because they're giving us those numbers in 2005, the year 2005, what a dollar was worth then. And one thing that's helpful in remembering as you think about uh, real versus nominal, so they'll cross on the year that you're using as the baseline uh, that the dollar is, you know, you're using that 2005 dollar. Prior to that year, real will always be higher than nominal. After that year, real will always be less than nominal. And if we had just picked uh, the year 1990, then the graphs would have crossed at that point and real would have been higher below and uh, nominal would have been higher above that year or after that year. So the, um, then you, have, you can use a deflator amount because in general, a dollar in 2005 didn't buy as much as it did in years before, and it bought more in 2005 than you can get for a dollar today because of inflation. So these changes in GDP over time, and we track them because they help us see business cycles, and that has real impact on the lives of us as people, the companies we work for, the communities we live and operate in. And so that idea that macro is um, harder to see because it's more of an indirect effect, we talked about the first week, it's important to understand that through GDP and tracking it, we can see business cycles and the likelihood of peaks and booms coming and from the past begin to try and guess what will happen in the future. And when GDP is growing uh, and the economy is experiencing a peak or a boom, when it's um, stagnant or it's even declining, then we talk about a bust or trough, but we're in a down cycle. And we're experiencing some of that now uh, because of the pandemic. We can look, when we compare one GDP of one country to another, we have to understand that often they're reported in different currencies. If I'm in Germany, I might be talking about the Deutschmark or the Euro. If I'm in London, I'm talking about the pound or the Euro. If I'm in Japan, I'm talking about the yen or the RMB in China. And so to make the comparisons, we have to get to one currency versus comparing just two currencies. And then we also use something called purchasing power parity, uh, trying to understand what you can actually buy with that money in a particular location. Because I've been in many parts of the world, about 30 of the roughly 200 countries. By the way, you should know there are about 200 countries in the world, depending on where you are, which ones you consider sovereign nations and not. And if you get macroeconomics and you're a business major, it's going to really help you with your international business class. About one third of that class really is macroeconomics. But purchasing power parity allows us to say, what can you buy? I've been in lots of parts of the world where food is cheaper. I've had really nice meals at great restaurants for $3 with multiple courses. Uh, but maybe electronics are even more expensive. And so we try to understand what can you buy with that um, that money or that size economy. And it's also important to recognize the number of people in that economy because a country is a country is a country, but a country is not a country in the sense that they're not all equal size. I mean, we have countries like India and China with over a billion people, 1.2, 1.3 billion people. And we have countries like Liechtenstein with 30, 35,000 people, which is about the size of Chai Lai. So one country might be 35,000 people, another one might be 1.3 billion people, or one out of every five people alive today. Uh, so this graph just it shows a number of countries, and you can pause if you want and look at it in more in depth, but it shows their GDP in their currency, 
lists their currency next to it, rails, dollars, yuan, pounds, euros, rupees, etc. And then based on what the equivalent um, exchange rate is, converts everything to US dollars. So Brazil is 4.84 trillion, but when you convert that to dollars instead of reals, so that's reals, it's 2.2 for six trillion dollars so we got to get it in the same currency and you do that by taking the first row and dividing it by the second row and then here we can start to compare based on population so it, now we've got everything in u.s dollars for our, each country how many people live in that country and so how much um if you were to divide the GDP, the gross domestic product, out giving the same amount to every individual, how much would they get? And you can go online and you can check and see uh, what this is like. We will not be the top uh, per capita, per person GDP. We have the largest economy in the world, but we, in terms of the highest GDP, but we do not have the highest per capita once you start trying to divide that out by the number of citizens in that country. And that's a great starting point for understanding living standards for sure. Um, it doesn't include everything though, such as maybe some resources are being depleted in order to have the economy that large and that uh, affluent such as fishing banks in Newfoundland, Canada. It could be that um, we're seeing increases because we're having to buy new things like security systems for our home uh, to be able to protect ourselves because there's been an increase in crime. Or we have to, um, we have more being spent on households because there's more households because we have greater divorce. And so uh, it isn't a perfect measure of how the economy is doing. It doesn't include a GDP, gross domestic product, does not include things like self-production. If I grow my own crops, when I have my small farm here, I know lots of families that are poor in other parts of the world that grow a good portion of what they eat. And so there's no spending taking place, so that's not calculated. Also, goods and services that aren't produced in the legal market or aren't even captured in the market. So if I grow some food and sell it to my neighbor, it probably doesn't get captured. There's uh, no record of that. But uh, more importantly are things like the sale of weapons, people, drugs, the three worst criminal kind of um, activities around the world. But anything that is sold uh, up without kind of going and working through the legal market, we wouldn't record and it wouldn't be taxable and we wouldn't count it as part of GDP. Other things that might be really important to consider is the gap between the most affluent and the least affluent in an economy. And if that gap is getting narrower or wider, that might be a measure of the health of the economy, not just uh, GDP or GDP per capita. It also doesn't necessarily measure happiness. The wealthiest people in the world are not the happiest people in the world. In fact, there is a relationship between the two, but what we know is money makes you happier up to a point, and then it seems to have very little effect, and I would even argue after a certain point can have a negative effect on your happiness as you have to wonder if friends are friends with you because of what they can get, if people are always waiting for you to pass away because they're looking forward to what you're leaving them, um, that you can actually see a decrease after a certain income in your overall happiness. So happiness and in, uh, income per person or GDP per person isn't necessarily a perfect correlation. Also, while it's a good starting point to look at, we might want to look at other things like how likely is a newborn to survive infant mortality rates? How likely are you to be able to gain an education and be literate? Um, we're after a good life. We're not after just a good income. And while the two are somewhat correlated, they're not perfectly correlated. And just having a good income doesn't ensure a good life. Not having a good income doesn't ensure a bad life. 
So again, in this exercise, you will have a choice. You can pick one or the other. You do not need to do both. Again, if you do, no problem, but you only need to respond to one of the two. You can either pick three countries from three different continents that you would like to visit and then compare and contrast their GDP per capita and their purchasing power parity with that of being here in the U.S. and to one another. So what might be the easiest, cheapest place for you to visit, which is going to be the more costly place for you to visit kind of things. The second is you can look at what are things that we might use to measure the health of an economy other than GDP. And there's an example there given to you. We might look at the number of public pools in a country and determine that that means that the student, the, the people, the, the citizens are more physically active if there's more pools and there's more vibrancy in the country. All right. Thanks. Take care.